Hey everyone, in today's video we're going to be talking about Loris and Dream Boothing. Now, very similar to embeddings and hyper networks, and please definitely check that video out first if you haven't seen that. It's going to have some of the building knowledge that you'll need to understand this video completely. But today's video is going to cover the next steps. Loras are more powerful than embeddings, but very similar in a lot of ways. And the Dream Booth process is probably the most powerful process that we have access to, to very quickly capture the essence or the style of whatever type of art we're providing to the model. Now, this video, we probably won't need to go as deep into comparison or to really understand because we've covered a lot of that basic knowledge in video one. But I do very quickly want to cover the difference between Laura and Dream Booth because they're going to use very similar processes. The first biggest difference between the two is size. Loras are significantly small. What we're getting is very similar to an embedding. It's a token, it's something that is shareable, but you may want to look at it as an optimized version of the type of training that we're going through. It's able to take this large complicated process and compress it down to just 14 or 15 megabytes, which is very tiny. Dream Booth takes your whole checkpoint, makes a separate copy, and then influences the heck out of that checkpoint. Now, space may not be an issue for you when you start, but after just a few checkpoints, with each of these being anywhere between 2 to 4 gigabytes, it very quickly adds up. So, something to consider. Loras will save as .pt files, which you can easily share, and a Dream Booth will save as a .checkpoint or a .safe tensors file, which you could also share, but you probably have to do that through like Hugging Face or something bigger. Now, I would hope you're not interpreting this as choosing one or the other, because you probably want to use a combination of both. Loras, just like embeddings, can be used within prompts. They can be mixed and matched, they can be added to any kind of compatible model, and Dream Boothing is creating compatible models. But the consideration, of course, is your Dream Booth is your checkpoint. You're influencing the model directly and making your own. Using embeddings, hyper networks, Loras, and Dream Booths all together, you should end up with an arsenal of different models and different styles and different custom tokens and tags that you can essentially add to your own art. In some of my earliest Stable Diffusion Tips videos, I reference websites like Lexica where you could go and search for different prompts, and you'd end up with these really long, complex prompts. What you'll find after you start doing your own training, though, is your prompts will get progressively shorter and shorter. Building these files, these embeds, these hypernetworks, these LORAs, you can pack that visual concept into a file and apply it over and over again in different ways. And hopefully that makes sense. Now, I'm going to go through the steps that I go through. This may not be perfect. I remember when Dream Booth was first added to the Auto 1111 repository, it was kind of a mess and it was very difficult to figure out. So this is how I got it working. Exactly like the textual inversion video, we're going to head into the training section and we're going to pre-process these images. Whatever we have that we're looking to train, we just want to generate those blip captions for it. So we end up with the text file description. Something to think about at this point is you're going to need two keywords. One word is a class description. If I was using a bunch of different cats, for example, I could use the word cat as a class descriptor. Now I'm also going to need a very unique word, something that's very specific to this training. This is easier because you can just make up a word, throw something in there that has an underscore, or something the model doesn't have any association to, and you're fine. The super unique word is the one that you're going to be throwing into a prompt when you really want to trigger the effect of the Dream Booth or the Laura. What we're training is going to have a very close association with that particular word. So anytime that word appears in the prompt, the model weights, whether we're using a Dream Booth or a Laura, they should respond accordingly. And the class descriptor is overall what we're training. For example, if we're training cats, then what exists within the model is what we're training kind of away from, or we're training that towards something else. An example that should make perfect sense here is Morgan Freeman. He exists within the normal stable diffusion model. So you can prompt for Morgan Freeman and get a picture of him. It won't be great because he's not overly trained, but you could work on that training. Creating my own Dream Booth version of the 1.5 model with an increased training on Morgan Freeman, I'm able to get more photorealistic quality pictures of him if I wanted. I used him as an example because it's easier to understand that the specialized keyword that I used for him would be Morgan underscore Freeman, which would be unique. And the class descriptor is just the word man. In this special model, any man is going to come out looking more and more like Morgan Freeman because I'm training man to look more and more like Morgan Freeman. Taking a look at the extensions panel, there's two extensions that you're going to want to install. The first one is for Dream Booth, and that's going to allow you to do Dream Booths and Loras. The second one is called Locon, 
And from my understanding, that gives you access to a better version of Loris. So go ahead and grab that as well. I'm going to include a link for both of them in the description below. With both of those extensions installed, you'll have a Dream Booth tab at the top of the Auto 1111 repository. You're going to want to head there, and we're going to create our first Dream Booth. On the first page towards the left hand side, go ahead and select the Create tab, and we're going to create a model. And the model is going to be based off of one of the models we already have. So if you want to use the regular 1.5, that's fine. If you want to use a custom Dream Booth model that you're familiar with, go for it. The sky's the limit. Go ahead and check out the input settings, and you'll probably want to click on this performance wizard. It's going to take a look at what video cards you have and set up your settings accordingly. Hopefully you don't end up with any issues, because I'm really not sure what to tweak if something doesn't work. This has worked great for me. And again, I'm using a 3080 Ti. You may want to add the Xformers command to your batch file if you have any kind of memory issues or if you want increased performance. From what I read, Xformers is great to have if you can support it. There's quite a lot of sliders here. This is a complicated looking process, but it's actually quite easy. But one of the things that I do make sure to do is set up a sanity prompt if I'm going to be training a Dream Booth model. If you've done textual inversion training, you're used to seeing output as training goes on. But that type of training is additive. We're not actually changing the model. In terms of our Morgan Freeman model, for example, we want to make sure that we don't destroy the concept of man if we're training in this very unique concept. Dream Booth allows you to directly affect giant classes of words, and that can be very powerful, for good or for bad. As training goes on, that same prompt is going to get very heavily influenced. It's going to change drastically, as more and more input data affects the word man within our training. In an example like this, we're going to use photo of a man as our sanity prompt, and when we get sample output, we're going to get one that uses the keyword and one that just uses man. And personally, that's the way that I get an idea of whether or not something is done cooking. The Concepts tab, we're going to be filling out a lot of information. The big choice to make here is, are we training more of a person, or are we training a concept, like a style or an object? The difference between the two is that if you train a person, you're going to get classification images. The system can automatically make a number of different comparative images, and then that's part of your training process. It takes a little bit longer, but it's pretty cool. If what you're trying to take away is a little bit more abstract and maybe just the essence of the picture, then maybe try the other option. What's on your screen right now is what I use. The first directory is where your images are located with the text files. The second directory can be an empty directory. This is where it's going to put classification images if you're training a person. If you put something here and you're training an object, nothing goes in there, so nothing to worry about. The instance token is going to be the unique word we thought up earlier. The class token is going to be the class token we thought up earlier. And you can see for the instance prompt, for the class prompt, I actually just put the word file words in brackets, and that works just fine. Personally, when I'm doing this for the sample image prompt, I use both the class word and the instance keyword to make sure that I fire on all cylinders. As you can see, it's possible to add up to four concepts all at the same time, in the same training. This isn't something I have a ton of experience with that's probably a really complicated way of doing things. I would suggest starting just one at a time to get the hang of it but it does give you an idea of how powerful this tool really is. A hot tip for you if you're creating a custom model name in the savings section, you may want to include your keyword in the event that you have a lot of models. It might be hard to keep track of what instance keywords you use for each one. And so for me, that helps. At this point, we're actually done. We could hit the train button and a Dream Booth model would start training right away. The only difference between what we've done here and setting this up so that we end up with a LoRa instead would be heading back to the settings page and just checking the box for LoRa and LoRa extended. It's convenient that both of these processes have the same setup, but both of them have very different output. So before you hit train, you want to really consider what you're going to be using this for. Do you need something that's universally applicable to most of your other models? Or do you need your own custom model for very specific purposes? Letting the system know that you're looking to create a LoRa unlocks the LoRa section within the saving area as well. Checking the LoRa box means you won't be getting a Dream Booth checkpoint in my experience. So you're going to want to dig into the Dream Booth extensions folder, find the .pt file when all is said and done, and move it. Within your web UI folder, you're going to have your models folder. Within that, another folder called Dream Booth, the name of the model that you've created, and then a folder called Samples. The samples folder is going to fill up with the training images as things train out. You're probably getting your sanity prompt, as well as the other prompt that uses the instance token. And it's very possible for you to look at that sample data and say, you know what, enough is enough, this is good enough for me. 
You can cancel training early if you've checked the box that allows you to create a checkpoint off of that, or a Laura. So understand your options, but also understand that this can be sometimes a very quick and very powerful process. It might go faster than you expect. When training is complete, ideally you should restart Sable Diffusion. If you decided to go the Dream Booth route, a new checkpoint is going to be listed in your menu. Go ahead and select it. If you went the Laura path, take a look where your hyper networks and your embeddings are stored, and you should see something new listed there. With Allura, you can put it into any of your prompts, use it with any of your models that are compatible. And, of course, with the Dream Booth, you can just use it like a model. Remember your prompt foo, though. You've got a specialized class word to keep in mind and a specialized instance keyword to keep in mind, if and when you decide to use them. You can even compare the exact same prompt to the version of the model before your training and the version of the model after your training. And sometimes that'll teach you more than anything what biases are actually being affected and how some of these settings can kind of work out and be tweaked. Don't take my videos as a catch-all. I certainly don't know everything. Just like my textual inversion video and most of what I've learned here so far, I get a ton of feedback from viewers like yourself, from working with people in my Discord, from Reddit, all kinds of different places. And this technology is constantly in flux. In fact, updates took place between the time I recorded and the time I edited, so I had to take a bunch of new screenshots to show you guys what the updated system looks like. But I'll never complain that AI is moving too fast. And I know this is going to hopefully open up a lot of doors for people who've been really struggling with AI art, or just kind of coming into the fold. There's a lot to wrap your head around at this point. Your likes, subscriptions, even dislikes, anything that helps the YouTube algorithm is really, really helpful for me, so I really appreciate that. But as always, thank you for watching.